the song said, I was glad when they said, let us come into the house of the Lord. So I welcome you here today and those of you online who have chosen to come and worship together as God's believers here at Chatham Heights Baptist Church. And we want to do that by praising his holy name. Would you rise to your feet and let us exalt him now. seated. This morning we are going to read from the Gospel of Matthew in the 21st chapter, and we will look together starting with verse 23. Yes. Now when Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him while he was teaching. And they said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Well, Jesus said to them, I'll ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I'll also tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John was from what source? From heaven or from men? Well, they began reasoning among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he'll say to us, Then why didn't you believe him? And if we say it's from men, well, we fear the people, for they all regarded John as a prophet. And answering Jesus, they said, Well, we do not know. And he also said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. 
but what is it that you think? A man had two sons, and he came to the first, and he said, Son, go work today in the vineyard. And he answered, I will not. But afterward he regretted it, and he went. And the man came to the second and said the same thing, and he answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Now, which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. And Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, the tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and prostitutes did believe him. And you, seeing this, did not even feel remorse afterward so as to believe him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for his word. Praise and give God the glory with me. Would you rise to your feet as we sing, To God be the glory.
to them, but reveal through them as well. So, Heavenly Father, we pray that you hear our prayer, our prayer for your people in a time that you have called us and placed us and made us your own. In Jesus' name, we lift up one another now. Amen. We have to, at some time or another, decide to follow Jesus. So I invite you one more time, if you would, in worship to sing with us to follow Christ. Would you rise to your feet? Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. All your ways are good. All your ways are sure. I will trust in you alone. Higher than my sight. High above my life. I will trust in you alone, in you alone. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow you. Whom you love, I'll love. How you serve, I'll serve. If this life I lose, I will follow you. going to be dealing with today comes from the Old Testament and comes from a place that we don't often go to. <laughs> we are looking into Ezekiel and we are looking into particularly Ezekiel in chapter 18 in verses 1 through 4 and then we're going to go down to verses 25 through 32. Ezekiel says, then the word of the Lord came to me saying, what do you mean by using this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, Well, the fathers eat the sour grapes, but the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, declares the Lord God, you are surely not going to use this proverb in Israel anymore. Behold, 
all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine, and the soul who sins will die. Then if you'll join me in verse 25. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not right. Here now, O house of Israel, is my way not right? Is it not your ways that are not right? When a righteous man turns away from his righteousness, commits iniquity, and dies because of it, well, for his iniquity, which he has committed, he will die. And again, when a wicked man turns away from his wickedness, which he has committed and practices justice and righteousness, he will save his life, because he considered and turned away from all his transgressions, which he had committed. He will now surely live, and he shall not die. But the house of Israel says, well, the way of the Lord is not right. Are my ways not right, O house of Israel? Is it not your ways that are not right? Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, each according to his conduct, declares the Lord God. Repent and turn away from all your transgressions, so that iniquity may not become a stumbling block to you. Cast away from you all your transgressions, which you have committed. Make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit, for why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, declares the Lord God. Therefore, repent and live. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness is part with precious of Jesus Christ Leave behind your regrets and mistakes Come today, there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy from the ashes the new life is born, Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness is part with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Yes. 
Does grace trump the past? Ezekiel is one of the more interesting prophets in the Old Testament, but the truth is we sometimes don't understand exactly what was a prophet in the Old Testament. Oh, we have ideas and we have things that we thought are associated all the times with a prophet, but not necessarily are they all exactly right. First of all, prophet means spokesman not fortune teller. The one whom in their unfathomable audacity the prophets claim to speak for was the Lord God himself, creator of the universe. They said, I have for you the word of the Lord. There is no evidence to suggest that anyone ever asked a prophet home for supper after services that day more than once because they got too much when they got him home. The prophets were like that. They could be rough and ready. One day some city boys followed along the prophet Elisha. They started calling him things like, hey, Baldy. I'm sorry, Robbie, I didn't mean to look over your way. And he was so tired of fooling with them that he called down two she-bears who proceeded to tear 42 of the city boys from limb to limb. And then he went on to his appointment at Mount Carmel feeling very good about himself. The prophet Jeremiah, he showed a clay pot to the crowd of Judeans and told them that this represents Judah. And when he was done, he smashed it to smithereens and told them this was a mild version of what God has in mind for you guys when he is finished. And he was right. In a dream, the prophet Ezekiel that we spoke about ate a copy of Scripture, ate it whole, tabs and everything, even the appendices and maps in the back of it. And he told them, well, it tastes like honey. That's the word of God. In the time of the prophet Amos, the Israelites looked forward eagerly to the day when the Lord would finally come and deliver them from all their afflictions. And then Amos told them they'd better start looking forward to something else. Because when the day came, the Lord was going to settle a lot of people's hash all right. But the hash that would be settled first was to be Israel's. Quoting God, Amos would say, go on to say, Your great cathedrals bore me, just as stiff as your TV evangelists and your prayer breakfasts at the White House caused me no less discomfort than your dashboard, dashboard statues of Mother Mary. They mean nothing because your heart isn't changed. Justice is what I want, he would tell them. I don't want photo ops and righteousness is to be like an ever-flowing stream unto everyone. Jeremiah got so annoying that they took him and threw him into a cistern to shut him up or try to. But the echo was just right for him. The rumor is that Isaiah was sawed in half. They were so put out with him. It's not recorded how Amos got his, but you can only wager what it must have been. 
The prophets were drunk on God, and in the presence of their terrible tippiness, no one was ever comfortable when they got done. It was a total lack of tact that they had, and they would roar out against the phoniness and the corruption wherever they found them. They were terror on kings and priests. While the prophet Nathan tells the greatest king of all, David, face to face, you're a murderer and an adulterer. Prophet Jeremiah went straight to the temple and he said, Do not trust in these deceptive words you hear from these people, for this is the temple of the Lord. This is the temple of the Lord. This is the temple of the Lord. It just goes to show that prophets, like some pastors, have to repeat things three times to get their point across. And no prophet is on record having asked for the job. When God told Isaiah, I'm calling you, and Isaiah said, How long, O Lord? The answer he got wasn't very reassuring to him. Jeremiah pled, I'm too young for all of this. Nobody wanted to be a prophet, but God called them to be. Kind of like Abraham Lincoln's story about the man being read out on the town, out of the town on a rail. If it hadn't been for the honor of the thing he said, I'd have liked the ride. The prophets would have rather walked themselves. In the very opening of our text today in Ezekiel, we see this. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying. It was not Ezekiel's word. It was God's. And it's sometimes scary enough to think about that. To speak God's word. It's the kind of thing that would keep me up at nights. And it would probably keep you up as well. But what is Ezekiel trying to say in these first four verses? Well, he says, what do you mean by using this proverb that th must have been very popular to use? You know, a bit of wisdom. Because I hear the land of Israel saying, he said, the fathers eat the sour grapes, but the children's teeth are set on edge. We'll talk about that in a minute. As I live, declares the Lord God, you're surely not going to use that proverb in Israel anymore. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. But the soul who sins will die. Ezekiel prophesied among those who suffered the destruction and the exile that was wrought on much of the kingdom of Judah by the Neo-Babylonian Empire beginning around the 6th century B.C. Many of the Old Testament prophets, and Ezekiel's no exception, understanding such devastating events as divine punishment for their sin, the people's sin. And so they all, all those born in Judah and those born in captivity, it seemed bear the burdens of the sins for many, many years before they were even around. Even Lamentations, believed to be written by Jeremiah, mentions our ancestors sinned, they are no more, but we bear their iniquities. So here in Babylon in exile, it seems cynicism is rampant among them. So much so that it's captured in that proverbial wisdom of that one verse. The fathers eat the sour grapes, but the children's teeth are set on edge. In other words... The fathers ate the stuff that wasn't ripe, and they have suffered for it, but the children still have this gnawing in their teeth from their fathers having bitten into it. By the way, you ever bit anything like a grape that wasn't ripe yet? An apple that wasn't ripe yet? What did you do? Oh, my teeth will never be the same. That's what he's getting at. Only the proverb was that not only did those who came before you sin this way it, it's fallen upon you as well the die is cast in other words the the game is fixed the outcome predetermined so they cried out to one another but ezekiel says god has come to straighten this notion out though our sins and even those of our forebears have repercussions for our descendants they are not to be the final answer in other words you can't blame those for you sometimes though we're very good at blaming someone else for our errors and mistakes that were committed in the past. Basically from which we like to detach ourselves from that guilt. <laughs> it would be much easier if we would say to ourselves, well, I have nothing to do with the death of Jewish people under Nazism, or you know, with slavery in the Americas. 
I had nothing to do with that, and such tales of our ancestors, though, shape us for generations. How many children and grandchildren of the Holocaust still remind us to never forget such an evil thing? And we say, yes, you're right, we will never forget. And with good reason. We know the warnings of before. We would never dream to say to those people, the descendants of those suffered in those camps, well, just get over it already. I mean, it's the past. It has nothing to do with today or with me and mine. You wouldn't think of doing that. Because why? Because you know. It may be 80 years ago, but it still has repercussions. This text reminds us that we still weigh the past and take it into account. But this is where God gets to what we want to talk about today. We want to realize that we are responsible for a better future and a better present. We acknowledge what has been in order to shape who and what we will be today and who and what we will be tomorrow. That old saying about, uh, you know, of, of, the old, uh, of the old men eating the unripe and the, the young ones setting their teeth on edge. Somehow we are all connected to somebody else's sins. And we remember that, not just for the Old Testament, but for, from our lives. Remember Ham? You know, the son of Noah that got in trouble with Noah because he had seen Noah passed out in the tent drunk and naked. And, you know, he told everybody about it. And when Noah found out, he cursed Sam. And he says, your whole people are going to be accursed. And throws him out of the family, throws him out of everything. And for centuries, people would say, these people are Ham's descendants. Many from the pulpit. That somehow they were marked like Cain. And that they were getting the punishment of their children, uh, or excuse me, of their grandparents, and that their children and children's children would likewise be the same. Ezekiel instead tells us that God is breaking the cycle. This proverb shall no longer be used in Israel. It's a reminder how tough it is to be changed from our roots and our cause and effect look at things. Remember John chapter 9 with Jesus? Sure you do. That's that whole chapter deals with that wonderful story where Jesus goes up and he finds a blind guy. And remember his disciples said, Rabbi, who sinned? Was it this man or his parents? Obviously they hadn't read Ezekiel. He was born blind, Jesus says, that God's works might be revealed in him and through him. The past and the present work together to provide the glory of God to be revealed. In essence, how we respond matters. I am responsible for my response, regardless of what my past or present is. So Ezekiel then points out in those verses we didn't read, but if you get bored here in a minute, go ahead and read them. <laughs> he, he tells three stories of three successive generations that include a righteous man, a wicked son, and a righteous grandson. God reveals the righteousness or wickedness of each stands alone. One is not responsible for the actions and wickedness of the other. Ezekiel follows that with the concluding verses that each has the same opportunity. If a wicked person repents, none of her wickedness will be remembered. If a righteous person turns away, then none of his righteousness will be remembered, Ezekiel says. Now, if it ended right there, that would be tragedy because it feels so down. But God, as God often does, ends with hope. Verse 30, therefore I judge you, house of Israel, each according to your conduct. I'll judge you the way you act. Repent and turn away from all your transgressions so that iniquity may not become a stumbling block to you. Cast away from you all your transgressions which you committed. And this is the part. He says, make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why will you die, O house of Israel? I don't have any pleasure that anybody should die. So he ends by saying, therefore, repent and live. 
Here are the Hebrews, the children of God, Ezekiel's congregation, if you will, that he is preaching to, and they are suffering in exile, literally exile, not just kind of how we feel in exile with all the masks and with all the, the, the parameters of this pandemic and everything around us, but real exile, you know, you kind of where you, you have a different address and a different area code now. And they are in Babylon's territory. And surely those listening must have found it kind of hard to, to, to swallow the argument of Ezekiel about the righteous being rewarded and the wicked punished because after all, they're in the midst of punishment. So they're thinking, well, we must be the wicked. Well, if the shoe fits is what Ezekiel would say. But God's answer is still involving grace. God is willing to remove the consequence of death from those who have considered and turned away from all the transgressions that they had committed. But there's almost like hidden in there one non-negotiable. Those who would receive grace must admit their need for it. Mm. My need for grace. They must, as God puts it, turn then and live. Life is available to all who admit their ultimate reliance upon grace. For if we do and if we not only admit it and receive it, then there will be life, God says. And so change is possible, even in Babylon. We are neither condemned to the futility of the sins of others nor of the sins of the past. Change is possible. The future, it's open. We're neither helpless nor hopeless. Because with God, all things are possible. This is not only the heart of Ezekiel's word from the Lord to the exiles, it's the heart of God's word to us. We're feeling a little exiled sometimes, every day. We can easily forget that God has something in line for me, irregardless of my past, or from where it is that I have come. At North Pamunkey Baptist Church, there was a sweet young lady by the name of Amanda Hughes. When I first got there, Amanda had just finished high school and was getting ready to go to college. Amanda was black, and she lived next door to the church on Sassafras Lane with her family and another family known as the Tibbs. They were all kind of interrelated in that little street. It wasn't uncommon in the history of North Pamunkey Baptist Church because when I went back and looked at the, uh, at the records way back when, in 1810, the membership of North Pamunkey Baptist Church consisted, as they put it in their annual letter, 20 men, 35 women, and 102 people of color is how they placed it. I even joked with Amanda. I said, you know, Amanda, your ancestors could have taken over the church at any given business meeting. She said, yeah, if you'd let us vote. But here was Amanda coming to our church, singing in the choir praises to God and hoping. Because, see, she had a mother who was sweet as can be and a father who was an alcoholic and not very sweet. And she lived with other connective relatives, the Tibbses, who... I could talk forever about. <laughs> and yet from there, she continued to believe the grace of God had something in store for her. And you know where she went to school? On scholarship that she had earned and applied for? Columbia University in New York. To this day, she still lives in New York and has a successful career because she didn't believe that whatever her ancestors ate set her teeth on edge. But she believed that the grace of God came to each person in each generation. We are not going to be held hostage to past hurts or injustices, God reminds us. Those things that dominated us before are broken, and we are truly unshackled from them. We will never again succumb to the cry, what's the use? 
as the exiles felt. Because the message of God is grace. And the message of grace is hope. And the wor word of the Lord says, Grace trumps the past. Every time, everywhere, even twice on Sundays. Let's pray. Lord, it is so easy to feel defeated in Babylon. In our exile. It is so easy to even look at the way our life has turned from this to that. Or where we have come from, we feel disappointed of where we are. But remind us that you're the God of the present and the future. And that your grace is large enough to bring salvation to any of us if we will recognize the need for it and confess. Confess, O oh Lord, the hope of it for salvation in us. So Lord, remind us not of what has been today, but of what you are doing now, what you want to do, and what you will do. For we're each responsible for who we are and how we'll respond. In Jesus' name, remind us of that today. Amen. And the word of the Lord says, I will be the God of grace today, tomorrow, and forever. Receive the grace of God so that your life will be eternal life. Amen. God bless each of you. Now, if you will wait.